we will be recording the webinar and that will be posted and available for your review. So with that, um, I'd like to turn things over to Dr. Michelle Dritz. She is the medical director, uh, a medical director here at Ohio AAP. And Dr. Dritz, if you'd like to get us started. Sure. Thanks, Kristen. Um, well, welcome everyone to our Adolescent Health Series and our first of three webinars over the next few months designed to help you and your practices enhance adolescent health services and ultimately to improve the health and well-being of teens and young adults that you serve. Today's program, um, you can see the agenda here, but we'll focus on a, just a portion of the foundation of quality adolescent health, um, including how we can create and foster adolescent-friendly spaces and ways to engage both adolescents and their families in that care. At the end of the presentation, we'll have some time for Q&A, but as Kristen already mentioned, if you have a question, feel free to write it in the chat box so that we can kind of keep tabs of it and we can get to them at the end, hopefully as many as possible. Um, in addition, all of our presenters for this three-part adolescent uh, health series over the next few months are more than happy to be future resources for you if you have any questions or need advice in your own practice. You can reach any of us through the Ohio AAP office by simply asking Kristen Fluitt um, to help get in contact with us. As you know, all of the three webinars in this series will earn you both CME and MOC2 credit due to the recent changes in the American Board of Pediatrics. So to officially get that credit, you've done the first part, and that is being here or watching the recorded version of this presentation at some later point. But the last component of that credit is answering the 10 MOC questions that will be associated with today's presentation. And we'll be going quickly over those questions at the, after the end of each of our two speakers present on their portions today. So during the webinar today, just jot down or keep track of your 10 answers. And so at the end of the webinar, you can simply email those responses to Kristen Fluitt at the Ohio AAP office. She's the one who emailed you the link to today's webinar, so you can simply press reply on that email to send her your answer responses for the MOC questions. Otherwise, you can directly email her at her address, kfluitt, so K-F-L-U-I-T-T, -T, at ohioaap.org. This is me. I'm Michelle Dritz. As Krista mentioned, I'm an adolescent medicine physician in Dayton, Ohio. and I work at a private pediatric group called Cornerstone Pediatrics that serves both children and adolescents. I'm also the medical director of the Ohio AAP's Learning Collective, focusing on improving adolescent health that we call QITU. If you're interested in learning more about the QITU program or any of the other many resources and programs the AAP has on adolescent health, please feel free to reach out to Kristen at the office and we'd be happy to help. I'd also like to take a moment to thank our sponsors for their time and resources and funding, including the Ohio Department of Health and the Ohio Chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics. So on to introductions. Our two presenters today are Dr. Gaia Shelva Kumar and Dr. Ellen Realm. Dr. Chalvok Kumar is a member of the Section of Adolescent Medicine at Nationwide Children's and an Assistant Professor of Clinical Pediatrics at The Ohio State University College of Medicine. Her clinical interests include adolescent reproductive health care, working with underserved adolescent populations to improve access to care, health promotion and education in collaboration with community-based organizations. Dr. Ellen Rome is the head of the Center for Adolescent Medicine at Cleveland Clinic Children's Hospital and a professor of pediatrics at the Cleveland Clinic Lerner College of Medicine at Case Western. She continues to hold and has held leadership positions in many both medical and community organizations that serve youth, and her research and clinical interests include eating disorders and obesity, reproductive health care, and care and wellness. Both of these presenters are outstanding clinicians and tireless advocates for adolescent health and well-being, and I know you will learn much from them, as I know I always do when I get to hear them talk. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Shelvar Kumar. Enjoy. 
Um, thanks, Dr. Driss, for that great introduction. So, uh, as was mentioned, my name is Gaia Chalva Kumar. I'm a pediatrician and adolescent medicine physician at Nationwide Children's Hospital in Columbus, Ohio. And I was going to talk to you all today about um, the importance of creating adolescent friendly spaces and how to establish these spaces in the places where we work. Um, so we'll briefly go through why it is important to create these spaces, some of the barriers to care that adolescents specifically face when trying to access health care. We'll discuss why confidential care for adolescents is important um, and spend a lot of time on that. And then finally, we'll end by talking about some other strategies um, that can be implemented in office to help increase accessibility for adolescents. So we know that adolescence is a time of rapid growth and development, um, and that typically for most adolescents, it's also a time of good health. It's also a time, however, when many chronic physical, mental health, and substance use conditions first emerge, as well as health behaviors that may impact future well-being. We know also that the leading causes of morbidity and mortality in the adolescent population are preventable, things like sexually transmitted infections, substance use disorders, unintended pregnancies, motor vehicle crashes, and suicide. What we also know, however, is that health care and well care during this time period um, declines and opportunities for us to be able to prov provide preventative counseling are lost when we lose these, these opportunities. Creating adolescent-friendly spaces then can make adolescents feel more comfortable in the health care setting and make it more likely for them to access care and access these services. It also can increase the likelihood that they will seek preventative care in the future. So what are the barriers to care that adolescents face? So probably the number one barrier that adolescents face in accessing care, and this has been proven um, and replicated in multiple studies looking at adolescents' access to health care, is a perceived lack of confidentiality and restrictions on the health care that they're able to access on their own. Other barriers that adolescents have identified in seeking care are poor communication skills by providers, perceived insensitive attitudes of healthcare providers when they're accessing care, lack of provider knowledge, skills, and comfort in dealing with adolescents. On a personal level, lack of money, insurance, and transportation to access services. Um, having inaccessible clinic locations and or limited services offered at clinic locations. Um, for example, um, a patient may be able to go to Planned Parenthood, say, to access reproductive health services, but may not have a place where they can go for control and care of their asthma, a chronic condition that they suffer from. Limited office hours are another, is another barrier that's frequently been identified by both adolescents and their parents in accessing health care. Um, so we'll start first by talking about confidentiality, because this really is a cornerstone in being able to provide um, adolescent-friendly services in the office setting. So what is confidentiality? It's an agreement between the patient and their healthcare provider that any information that's discussed during or after the encounter will not be shared with others without the explicit permission of the patient. So why is it important in adolescent medicine? And I think there's really three key things to consider when we're talking about why confidential care is important. Number one is that it really is clinically essential. So for us as a providers to be able to provide um, care that's relevant and important for the teens, confidential care is important. It's also developmentally appropriate. Teens um, are growing and becoming more and more independent. And in order to be able to provide appropriate care, we need to respect their growing autonomy. It also is best practice as supported by expert consensus. And we'll go through each of these points a little bit more in detail. So we know that confidentiality affects adolescents' decisions to disclose sensitive information, things such as sexual preferences, sexual behaviors and practices, exposure to alcohol and drugs. Adolescents may not share this information if there isn't an assurance that this information is going to be kept private between them and their health care provider. We know also that it can affect decisions whether at all to seek care for certain conditions in the first place. Assurances of confidentiality also affect adolescents' decisions to return for follow-up care for certain conditions. 
So here are some studies that illustrate this point. Um, in the year 2000, there was a study done at 32 uh, public high schools in Massachusetts, and they found that the majority of students, over 76%, wanted the ability to obtain confidential health care, yet only um, less than half perceived that that care was actually available to them. Um, this is really the major, one of the major studies that supports why confidential care is really important for adolescents. In 2002, there was a study done at family planning clinics in Wisconsin, and they asked over 500 youth accessing the services how their behaviors would change if mandatory parental notification was required for access to contraception. What they found was 59% of youth reported that they would stop using all health services, even though the mandatory parental no notification was specifically for contraception only. About 11% said that they would discontinue or delay HIV testing and treatment, uh, again, even though the confidentiality provision was only around contraception. Um, can I quick ask, I think someone may not have their, their phone muted, if you don't mind. Um, muting the phone for some background noise. Thank you. Um, so about 11% only would discontinue or delay treatment for HIV and STI treatment, even though parental notification would only be around contraception. However, only 1% would actually stop having sex. So from a public health standpoint, if we're really looking to decrease rates of sexually transmitted infections, unintended pregnancy, being able to provide confidential care is really important because we know that these youth with mandatory notifications don't access care but don't stop the behaviors that are putting them at risk for some of these conditions. Um, we know that confidential care for adolescents is also developmentally appropriate. Bright Futures actually recommends offering private consultation time to all adolescents during well visits starting at the age or around age 13. Um, this is recommended because it helps foster increasing autonomy for youth. It also recognizes the adolescents increasing and developing intellectual capacity and their ability to participate in medical decision making and being able to provide informed consent for any new medications or treatments that may affect their health. It also helps patients um, or promotes patient ownership of their own health and body. And these are things that we really want patients to develop as they're nearing the age of 18 and getting ready to be independent and being in charge of their own health. It's really important to emphasize that the goal is not at all to eliminate parents from the visits, and parents are not, the, are not seen as the enemy. The real goal of this is to promote and respect the developing autonomy of the patient. Um, confidential care is also best practice as supported by um, expert consensus statements from many of the professional organizations that many of us are probably affiliated with. So there are policy statements supporting this care from the American Academy of Pediatrics, American Academy of Family Physicians, ACOG, the AMA, Society of Adolescent Health and Medicine. Um, and if you're looking for more resources or more information on why this care is so important, um, it can be found in these, in these statements. So while confidential care is very important, there also are some limits to confidentiality, especially with adolescents. So anytime a provider has any concerns about a patient's safety or the safety of others, confidentiality will need to be violated in order to ensure the safety of the patient. Um, we're all mandated reporters as healthcare providers, so anytime there's any suspected physical or emotional abuse, that also needs to be reported. Um, there may be cases where disclosures are required by court, and so confidentiality may need to be broken in those cases as well. And there are many uh, diseases that are reportable as well, specifically STIs. Important to note when these, these diseases are reported, it's not to the parents and the families, but to public health agencies for tracking purposes and partner notification purposes. In terms of actually providing confidential care in the in the office setting, it is important to set up expectations early. So one easy way to do this is displaying information about the confidentiality policy in the office, either in the waiting room, in exam rooms, and also discussing this routinely at well visits. Um, many of our colleagues 
starting at age 11 or 12, we'll have a discussion at the 11 or 12 year old well check saying, preparing patients and the parents for one-on-one um, -on -one time and confidential time at the upcoming visit, saying something like, you know, as we prepare for this your visit next year, know that I'm going to be spending some time with your child one-on-one -on -one just so we can privately talk about some issues related to development and their health. Um, it is important to still start the visits with both the patient and the parent present. Many times the parent will have um, more information about the patient's health and the reason for the visit than the patient themselves are able to provide uh, initially. It also gives us as providers a chance to sort of assess developmentally where the patient is at and how much time is appropriate to spend with the patient one-on-one -on -one versus with the patient and the parent together. At a certain point during the visit, um, it will be appropriate to ask the parent to step out. It is important, again, before you do this, especially if it is the first time, to explain why. Um, so again, those three reasons that it's clinically appropriate in order to provide best level care, it's developmentally, developmentally appropriate as children are gaining increasing um, autonomy, and it really is best, best practice in medicine. Um, it's also important to ensure that the parent will be brought back in for wrap-up and then to actually bring the parent back in when you're wrapping up so that the parent has um, an opportunity to ask any questions that they may have about their child's care. There can be some challenges to providing um, confidential care. One of the major ones is the explanation of benefits letter that goes out um, via the insurance companies that may disclose tests that have, confidential tests that have been ordered or confidential visit diagnoses. This is something that we're just very upfront about with patients if we are doing this testing, um, that there is a possibility that uh, their privacy and confidentiality may be violated through this letter going home. Through the electronic med was there a question? Um, through the electronic medical record, confidentiality may be violated as well. Um, it's, if parents request medical records on um, a youth, it may be possible that sensitive notes or sensitive test results are disclosed as part of that uh, record release. One strategy we've used through our clinic is we have the ability to mark certain notes and test results as sensitive. So if there is a record request, those uh, records are not automatically released without an okay um, a provider or a staff member. Patient portals can also uh, cause some issues around confidentiality. It often can be hard to know who you're communicating with through the patient portal if you're communicating with the parent or the patient themselves. Um, and then again, many patient portals will automatically result, uh, release test results and notes to patients and parents. Again, there are policies you can put in place to help avoid some of these inadvertent disclosures. Again, in our clinic, we keep certain test results like STI results um, confidential, and those are never released over patient portals, and notes also are kept confidential and not released through that mechanism in order to protect our patients' confidentiality. Um, through the office culture, too, there may be inadvertent breaches of uh, confidentiality if staff is not used to sharing a patient's um, or is used to sharing a patient's full information with parents. They may not know that certain, again, certain test results or certain um, diagnoses are meant to be kept confidential from parents, and so it's important that we are educating the rest of our office staff, um, primarily nurses and front desk staff, that certain information in the medical record may be, may be private. I did want to spend a little bit of time reviewing Ohio law specifically around confidentiality and minors' access to care. It's important to note um, that laws around access to care for minors and confidentiality does vary from state to state. There are also um, different institutions have specific policies sometimes around this care as well, um, and specific practices may also have their own policies. So it's important wherever you are practicing that you're aware of what uh, what the rules and policies are regarding this care. For the state of Ohio, there are two really great resources that are available. One is this Minors Access to Reproductive Health Care in Ohio pamphlet, and the other is um, guidance through the Ohio AAP on teen health consent and Ohio law. At the end of the PowerPoint presentation, there are some links to resources, and links to both of these are provided there. 
But just to quickly review some of the confidentiality, specifically in Ohio, what the law allows, um, when we're talking about sexual health and then specifically about sexually transmitted infections, minors are allowed to consent to testing and treatment of STIs. Um, they are also in the state of Ohio allowed to consent to expedited partner therapy. And what this involves is if a patient tests positive for a sexually transmitted infection, they then can receive either medication or a prescription for two of their partners or potential contacts um, that may have contracted that infection as well. When we talk about con contraception, Ohio law is actually silent around issues of contraception, but federal law does does require that Title X clinics provide these services confidentially to minors, and most of us who provide adolescents health care follow the federal statutes. In terms of sexual offenses, and this unfortunately is something that does, does come up when we're dealing with adolescent care, it's important to note that in the state of Ohio, sexual contact with any person under 13 is illegal and a criminal offense and must be reported right away. And then also sexual contact with anyone between the ages of 13 and less than 16 by a person who is older than 18 is also considered um, illegal and should be reported right away. In terms of confidentiality re regarding pregnancy care, minors can consent to pregnancy testing. When it comes to pregnancy-related care, there are no um, specific state statutes, but most most clinics that do provide care for teens who are pregnant do require some level of parental consent, and parental consent may be required for specific treatments and procedures. When we talk about termination services in the state of Ohio, parental consent is required, but there is a mechanism called judicial bypass by which a teen can appear before a juvenile court judge um, and if they can show that they are mature enough to make this decision for themselves and that parental notification um, would, be, would be harmful to them or negative to them, then they can obtain permission from a judge to seek these services without parental permission. In terms of adoption, Ohio does allow minors who are 12 and older to choose to place their child up for adoption. In terms of mental health services, youth who are 14 and older are allowed to access some limited mental health services, but it is important to note that medications cannot be prescribed. For alcohol and drug abuse treatment, um, those who are over the age of 12 can consent to treatment for those services. So some last minute tips on providing um, confidential care in the office setting. It is very helpful to display the office policy in confidential, on confidential care prominently, just so parents and patients uh, can be aware of what office practices are. It's also helpful to obtain confidential phone numbers or methods through which to be able to communicate sensitive information to adolescent patients. Important to quickly or candidly discuss possible breaches of confidentiality that may occur, as we discussed earlier. Um, and it also is helpful to have a list of clinics um, or locations where patients and families are able to access fully confidential services. This might be places such as Planned Parenthood or public health clinics, et cetera. So we spent a lot of time talking about confidentiality because that is the number one barrier that adolescents identify when trying to access this care. But there are a number of other barriers that they can face um, when trying to access health care. So when we talk about strategies to address these different barriers, I typically think of addressing them at three different levels. They can be addressed at the staff level, staff provider level, um, at a policy level, and at a space level. When we talk about staff level interventions that can be done, training really is the key one, specifically on issues related to adolescent care. Um, for staff, it's really important to emphasize that communication with adolescents is something that's highly valued and really important, and that having a friendly and non-judgmental approach can go a long way in making adolescents feel welcome at a specific practice. Uh, education about adolescent development can really be important too, talking about how there is this growing autonomy and independence and that the need for privacy and confidentiality is really important in this population. Helping staff understand also some of the challenges that young people may face in ac accessing healthcare, all of those barriers that we discussed earlier, is also helpful. 
Um, it's important that staff, as we discussed, are sensitive to young people's concerns around privacy and confidentiality, um, that they're aware that it is important to obtain confidential contact information. This is something that can easily be done during the registration process. Many young people these days have their own personal cell phones, um, emails, and so at a certain age, starting to obtain this information from youth is important. Um, establishing policies for patients to be able to come to visits alone um, so that they can discuss issues confidentiality with, confidentially with providers if they need to. Um, and doing things like explaining to young people why there's a long wait time or why they may not be able to see, be seen if they're late is very important. From a developmental perspective, um, adolescents can be very egocentric and me-focused, and that is totally developmentally appropriate and normal, but it can make it hard for them to understand, you know, why they can't always be seen right away, right when they want to be seen. From a space perspective, there's a lot that can be done. Um, having materials available in waiting rooms and exam rooms that are adolescent friendly and specific, talking about things such as substance use, mental and sexual health can um, go a long way to showing that an office is a welcoming space for adolescents. For some offices, this may involve having even a separate waiting area or designated exam rooms that are specifically for adolescents and contain these materials. Displaying posters and resources that are representative of the diverse populations that we serve, so posters with minority patients and populations, LGBTQ families, et cetera, can be also very helpful in establishing offices as well, welcoming open spaces for adolescents. And again, as we discussed, displaying information about confidentiality policies and waiting times. From a policy perspective, thinking about and developing policies on how to deal with issues that we've discussed, such as confidentiality, consent, billing procedures. Um, thinking about adopting flexible scheduling procedures for young people, so being um, having an opportunity for adolescents to do drop-in visits, um, having a process for converting sick visits to well visits, um, having extended hours, all of that, making those policy level changes can go a long way to making office visits more accessible for teens. Promoting practices to local schools and youth services um, can also help make your office a more friendly environment, letting people know that the office is not just for babies and young children, but is also a welcome and open place for teenagers as well is important. It may also be important to develop information sheets on specific um, specifics on how teens can access healthcare services, so not just on health health conditions that may affect teens, but how teens can access health care and take charge of their health care. So information on how to make appointments, what services are provided at what clinics, et cetera, may be helpful. So hopefully those are all helpful tips to help you um, make your office spaces more adolescent friendly. I'm going to quick go through um, five questions related to adolescent friendly spaces. So the first one, the leading causes of morbidity and mortality in adolescents are largely preventable. Is that true or false? So that is actually true. We know that many of the leading causes of morbidity in this population are, are preventable, which is why that well visit is so important so we can identify um, potential modifiable risk behaviors and screening practices to help reduce those causes of morbidity and mortality. Um, question number two, which of the following would not be a recommended strategy to improve adolescent health care visits? A, have adolescent friendly reading materials in the waiting room. B, educate staff about adolescent development. C, have a strict policy that no patient will be seen if they are more than 10 minutes late or D, provide transportation assistance to adolescent patients and their families? So the correct answer here would be C. Again, trying to have some flex more flexible policies around adolescent visits is helpful in making um, office visits more accessible to this population. Question number three, what, at what age does Bright Future recommend offering private time with adolescents during well care visits? Is it 10, 13? 15 or 18, um, and as we discussed, around 13 is when these confidential visits or one-on-one -on -one time during visits should start happening. 
Question number four. You are seeing a 15-year-old male for a visit. During the confidential part of the visit, he discloses that he has suicidal thoughts and a plan, and he does not want his parents to know. The best approach to this scenario is to A, respect his wishes and maintain confidentiality, B, call Child Protective Services, C, secretly notify his parents, but do not let him know you are doing so to maintain the relationship, or D, explain to the patient you are worried about his safety and need to notify parents and ask him how he would like this information to be disclosed. So the correct answer would be um, D, um, explaining to the patient that the information needs to be disclosed, but definitely notifying him that you're going to be violating the confidentiality, explaining why you're doing it, and then giving him some decision-making process around how that disclosure happens. Not if it happens, but how it happens. All of the follow question number five, all of the following are reasons confidential care of adolescents is important, except A, it is clinically important, B, it's developmentally appropriate, C, it's supported by expert consensus, or D, state law requires it. So the correct answer here is D. Um, as we discussed, state law <laughs> varies. I'm just laughing at seeing all your correct answers coming through, so thank you for that. Um, so the last answer, it's D, um, that state law requires it. Um, as we discussed, state law varies from state to state, um, but the real reason we provide this confidential care is because it's clinically important, developmentally appropriate, and is, support, is best practice as supported by expert consensus. So I have included some references and resources um, if you're looking for more information on this topic, um, since that was a pretty quick overview, but hopefully you find that helpful, um, and it'll help you with, your, with creating friendly spaces within your own practices. And with that, I will pass it off to Dr. Rome. Thank you, Gaia, and uh, try to seamlessly move in to how we can use social media to engage adolescents and families uh, uh, for our well visits. So first off, who are our teens now? Uh, in, and let's introduce the founders, the post-millennial generation. This is not Gen Z. It's not iGen, as Apple would have loved them to be called. It's not the plurals. But MTV actually pulled 1,000 kids, and that bastion of science, Vogue, um, wrote an article uh, t talking about how they grandiosely named themselves the founders. Uh, so their constant social connection has made these founders incredibly comfortable in the spotlight, and it's created a generation of YouTube and Snapchat stars. Uh, another characteristic of being a founder is having realistic expectations for the future. Millennials tended to believe that everything was within their grasp, but founders have grown up in a crippled economy uh, where their parents have struggled to pay the bills or hold down a job or even keep their home. So the recession has left our youngest generation with much more risk-averse mindset than their debt-ridden predecessors. So the difference between the two is important to kind of think about as we engage them and recruit them to uh, keep our efforts partnered with them to be relevant for their future. Uh, so Gen, um, Gen Z or founders may be less focused than their millennial counterparts in school, um, they may create a document on their school computer, do a research on their iPhone or tablet, take notes on a notepad at the same time, finish in front of the TV with a laptop while FaceTiming their best friend. So how many people have seen that at home or elsewhere? Uh, and they're efficiently shifting between work and play, and they've got multiple distractions going, uh, you know, way more multi, multi, multitasking. Uh, so we can think about how this kind of flow might reshape our offices as well while we engage them. And so when you think about the millennials, who were they? Those are our 18 to 22-year-old patients, and uh, they reach adulthood by 2000, as opposed to the founders who are reaching um, birth by 2000. So the millennials expect technology to work, and they're a social generation. Uh, they socialize while consuming and deciding to consume our health care products and services as well as what's branded and marketed in their community. Uh, so we want to collaborate and co cooperate with them and with us to brand our version of delivered health care. 
Millennials are looking for adventure and whatever comes their way and crave discovery. They're passionate about values. Um, so that means the values of your office practice and how you respect confidentiality and how you uh, engage them and, and, and power them up. And uh, so, so this makes a difference. Sorry, mastering technology. Here we go. Um, so how do we engage them? Um, and uh, when we think about it, we want to focus on the visual instead of the textual. So that may mean opting for Instagram over Facebook. Uh, Facebook is comfortable for my generation. Instagram and Snapchat are my kids. Instagram is more abbreviated. It's more mobile friendly than Facebook. And most tweens and teens use social media almost exclusively on their smartphones. So there was a, a survey in 2015 uh, where a third of American teens said that Instagram was their preferred social network. Facebook isn't dead. There's 15% of teens choosing Facebook as their number one. But as we engage them, we should consider what's reaching and relevant for them. And you can also look at other emerging social platforms. Today it might be Snapchat. Tomorrow it may be something else. Invest in mobile-first campaigns. So phones are a way that our founders are interacting with the world. So if we looked at data from Upfront Analytics, members of this next generation watch twice as many videos on their mobile phone as any other cohort. So mobile campaigns may get them feeling included and connected and reached. Allow for interaction and engagement with consumers or would-be consumers. Consider campaigns that include a way for founders' voices to be heard, such as live voting or quiz taking, so they care less about sales or, um, um, or, or pitches to be heard or represented. They want to be drawn in by uh, what's witty and authentic and not talking down to them. So um, we want to be careful about how we're using our chat speak like LOL or ROFL or other um, acronyms, et cetera. The founders want to be, uh, want, you want to encourage sharing. Going viral about a positive health message whenever possible is a great brass ring in digital marketing. So what motivates people to voraciously share a piece of content? Turns out there's a few things we can actually do. One showed that more positive content is shared than negative content. Content that has real-world application and tapped into, uh, tapped into humans' natural desire for acceptance is also inher inherently more shareable. So that's usable by teens, for teens, with teens. So let's move into evidence-based strategies to engage youth that have actually been shown and demonstrated elsewhere that get you through the door, improve your own clinic's quality and metrics, and can improve policies and procedures. So getting you through the door first. One strategy that worked in Iowa was using QR code posters. This was Greek to me. But it turns out that the Iowa AAP received funding from, the, from National AAP in support of the Healthy People 2020 goal to address health literacy and health behaviors among Iowa youth. So their purpose was to educate and engage youth 12 to 18 years old around identifiable targeted health-related issues using technology and social media. There were more than 200,000 Iowans between the ages of 12 and 18, and 90% of 95% of those teens use the internet regularly. More than 80% were using social media networking sites, and a third were using the internet to get in their information about health and wellness. So they engaged their uh, their Iowa youth using focus groups and did some surveys on their social media sites. Teens could then swipe from the poster uh, a topic, and a topic might be confidentiality or um, adolescent girls using indoor tanning beds or overweight kids at risk for obesity or bullying and hazing, flu exposure, sexual health, safe teen driving. And after downloading, downloading an application used to scan the QR codes, teens could scan the codes in the office on the poster or on, from a website or from wherever and read, receive immediate gratification information on the spot. Great way to reach them, highly successful program. So these are some examples. Every age, even teen age. Uh, they had an interactive photo booth at sports events 
that then promoted uh, every kid to schedule an annual visit. And this was also targeting their parents to schedule your teen an annual visit. So you also want to leverage your other options as well. So, so for instance, uh, a sports physical doesn't have to be just a sports physical. It's a way uh, to uh, get all of the right futures uh, questions asked and, and surveyed and, and, and get the teen and the parent engaged. So the Oregon report recommended ways to leverage both sports physical and um, preventive visits and to merge them as one. Uh, so this is not rocket science. The only difference is billing in time. A sports physical, physical can equal time for a well care visit. Other ways to leverage missing opportunities. Uh, so the Iowa Teen and Parent Focus Groups found that they could, uh, parents could also share that they did not want to go for well visits annually um, themselves. The parents um, were anti-well visits at the time uh, for, the, for their own health. So helping them care for themselves as well as helping for the kid ended up in improving population health. And yet many parents stated that they never missed a dentist appointment ever. So that um, they suggested that the health care provider's office could schedule the next appointment automatically while the teen is there just as a dentist's office would. Parents struggled with the concept of taking their healthy teen to the health care provider and paying a copay. So the health care provider's office explained that many insurance companies pay for annual well visits without collecting a copay, uh, which many parents thought was beneficial information and helped them be more informed consumers when they were signing up at the next round. One parent mentioned that taking their teen to a well visit um, uh, when most other people at the healthcare provider's office was a sick visit, they wanted a, a sick door and a well door, an easy change. They wanted to see materials that were easy to read with large bold front. The, uh, font. They wanted uh, not to be overwhelmed or overloaded by too many words, and uh, they suggested ideas on color and bullet, bullet for, uh, points and ways to engage them that you can then promote, incentivize, and train providers. Uh, rural providers, uh, they uh, uh, were incentivized as, all, uh, as well, asking both teens and parents and providers what worked for them. They want messages uh, uh, in the rural offices that were laid back. They wanted to see the benefits of a checkup uh, in materials that they could that grabbed their attention. So again, these were ideas from teens and parents themselves. You can also uh, create adolescent-centric environments through training of staff, through uh, using youth-informed practices through either focus groups or surveys or even asking them as they're coming through your office. And that means um, everyone from the front desk to the medical assistant to the doc to the checkout person being adolescent-centric as they walk through the door. And so Texas created adolescent-centric environments through free online CME courses um, targeting the primary care providers and their staff. And there's many adolescent-focused courses uh, that they had actually generated. University of Michigan SPARC trainings are wonderful, and uh, uh, we hope to be disseminating them through our 27 family health centers in the, in the next year. Uh, and they're free prepackaged pre mini trainings uh, that uh, are free to use, and they include a PowerPoint presentation, they include a facilitator script, they include follow-up materials. They are designed to be given in 15 to 30 minute bullets at staff meetings or professional development opportunities. They can be facilitated by any level of caregiver to spark discussion and reflection among a multidisciplinary audience. If anyone's engaged in them, uh, I, I'm a big push for those. They're really wonderful. And what exactly is a spark? They're uh, mini trainings and they're designed to be 15 minutes or shorter or longer, depending on the depth of the conversation. And uh, the facilitator can guide the discussion based on the amount of time that they've dedicated or you know, what's available. And they have this ready-made PowerPoint, a script and the, and the materials, and uh, they're typically facilitated by one or two individuals from the organization. Um, and because they're short, they're accompanied by fun stuff like sparklers, which are the short activities that uh, can be case scenarios or use quotes or bingo or quizzes. Uh, and the facilitation guide is to make it easier 
uh, and to create a safe and supportive space for people to work together and learn uh, by providing a structure for the collaborative discussion. The facilitator is a person who effectively and efficiently can guide without directing, can bring about change without disruption, and can assist people and groups in constructing their own safe learning spaces. Wisconsin also did some great things with their patch program. It's providers and team, and team communication for health, and it's a curriculum, training, and technical Has left. designed by youth to improve the care of, uh, of, of youth with targeted training for providers and staff. And some of their patch-driven activism to improve uh, quality of care and services have included uh, their development of a vision statement and a mission statement. Uh, that they, pro they would prominently display in offices. These are the kind of activities you can have kids engage and devise for your own practice. This is another of the patch program values, uh, and these were driven and, and chosen by the kids themselves. They valued advocacy, storytelling, social justice, being treated respectfully and treating others with respect, passion for the information, passion about wellness, teamwork, innovation. So all of these values were generated by the kids themselves and promoted all over the Wisconsin offices. Other quality improvement projects, uh, such as the ones through our whole own Ohio AAP, include the talk where you're transforming adolescent care learning collaborative. From personal experience, you can get your Mach 4 for board recertification. You can also earn your Mach 2. You can get better at your HEDIS measures for your practice. And they're really a great way to transform care within your practice. We had 11 physician practices and approximately 11,000 patients. Uh, we found that more adolescents uh, went to full comprehensive well visits. We did uh, better HPV vaccinating and, and started improving rates. And we have more adolescents screened for high risk factors and for mental health, mental health issues using the TALK program. And this just says you don't need to reinvent the wheel. Uh, and the cartoon says, nah, I don't think it will work. Let's do something different, something smarter, something cooler, something we can Instagram or Snapchat about. So we want to make sure we're not missing our opportunities here. So adopt tools that highlight guidelines to improve your care. The Ohio chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics and the Ohio Department of Health are excited to announce the Fast Vax Fax mobile app which is now available on your Apple App Store and Google Play, uh, and you can download a flyer for your office. The app has for providers information on immunization safety concerns to share with parents on a tablet in your office, live time, the ability to share facts and resources directly from the app screen, and conversation tactics for when your parents say, no, I, I'm okay with the tetanus but not HPV today. So it gives you lines you can say directly back. For parents, it's got short videos recorded by a pediatrician on targeted topics that address the most common immunization questions and concerns. It's got an interactive immunization schedule customized by each kid's age, trusted answers to frequently asked questions, breaking news alerts on outbreaks or other news-related headlines, pediatrician-approved links and resources, and the ability to share things quickly and effectively. Other Ohio AAP teen resources include our parent teen contract for safe driving. You can download that, download that. And every year, October 19th to 25th is National Teen Driver Safety Week, so that's a great time to roll that out. But again, every day is a great day for safe driving. You have, we have the PACT for safe driving, which provides parent resources to help keep teens safe driving as well. And it has statistics available. And then there's other programs like Start with Hello, which um, is an offshoot of, um, of Sandy Hook, basically helping kids stay safe and bully-proof and um, engaging kids to go up to other kids and say, hey, do you want to come sit with me or can I sit with you in the cafeteria or on the playground or wherever else? Barriers to preventive care, uh, from a clinician's perspective, um, Gaia talked on this a bit, but we know that lack of knowledge and confusion about guidelines or available tools and lack of time and you don't believe you can deliver the recommended services and don't believe that the services delivered will lead to the desired outcomes or lack of motivation to change. When we have clinician-targeted strategies um, 
we can actually target each of these. When we also uh, use brief screening tools and um, integrated screening and EMR things that can make these barriers easier to break down, that also helps. So talking through some of those from, uh, from a kid perspective. Has left. That's a lot of somebody else. Um, so solutions. You, um, you can use gaming as a, uh, as a preventive tool. There's not enough data but lots of promise. So games and virtual environments may build extrinsic motivation and provide positive reinforcement for desired behaviors. Other things, um, Pitt and Aaron, Pitts and Aaron didn't want to um, um, more and more of their colleagues after schoolyard shootings. They wanted to help. So in tw this was back in 2012. They established Take This a blog for people in the industry to share their own stories of depressions with suicidal thoughts and anxieties. It was a huge success with hundreds of people eager to share their stories and hopefully help others. With all of the action and movement into, with today's youth, helping them interactively promote change can be something that we can engage them from an office visit onward. So harness that energy for good. And in ways that engages each young person. I wanted to make sure we had time for questions, so I know I'm running through this uh, a bit, but um, bringing it all together, youth are the solution. We want to hear their voices, we want to engage their voices and build for the future with their talents. That can help us expand capacity to improve our preventive visits. We want to keep it interactive. We want to make sure we're listening uh, to their parents too and engage our entire care team from the front desk person to the uh, person that cleans the floors to make sure we're doing things optimally for kids. I want to do a quick thank you. Top right is uh, are my two kids who shape a lot of my knowledge on media. And also the uh, top left in the Snapchat generation are my daughter's uh, uh, classmates who, in celebrating a great moment at their school, automatically caught it for themselves on Instagram. Now we're going to move to our questions. First question, uh, adolescent ac uh, adolescents accessing social media inevitably find misinformation and perpetuate myths about their health. True or false? And the answer is false. Um, they uh, you, you know, arm them with knowledge and they can have power to prevent ill health and, and build on their wellness. Ways to increase yearly preventive medicine visits include all except transforming a scheduled sick visit into a preventive care visit combined with an acute care visit, performing the preventive visit at the, set, at the same time as a sports physical, encouraging use of minute clinics for preventive care, proactively using social media to remind youth and families to schedule or attend a well visit. And the answer is uh, we, we don't prefer minute clinics. We prefer a medical home. Question eight. Provide, providers use, should engage youth voices in order to use adolescent ideas and opinions to help build youth confidence in the healthcare system so that they effectively and appropriately utilize the healthcare system, develop teen-centric messages that promote healthy choices or behaviors, empower youth to be agents of change in their communities, educate staff on what does and does not work to engage youth in their communities, or all of the above, and the answer is all of the above, well done. School-based health centers can perform terminations in some states, can provide needed mental health screening for adolescents, can be an all-inclusive medical home for most teens, and cannot administer vaccines. And the answer is they can actually provide some needed mental health screening for, all, for adolescents as well. Culturally appropriate care means that providers must be able to speak in all languages, front desk should, uh, including Klingon, Sub desks need to be uh, uh, same ethnicity as the clientele. Providers' inherent biases must be recognized and managed, or, and all written material should be exclusively in English. And the answer there is providers' inherent biases must be recognized and managed. That leaves us time for questions. And thank you both to Gaia and Ellen for really a wonderful presentation, for all of you guys for joining us today as we try to um, left. for adolescent health and well-being.